This video was brought to you by Insights, a platform to review and coach from the comfort of your own PC. Simply upload, review, and start strategizing all in real time. See why the pros are using Insights to organize and review their gameplay. Get your free account today. Thanks to Insights for supporting this series. Insights is the all-in-one platform giving you all the tools you need to organize, analyze, and review your gameplay footage, whether you're trying to work your way out of gold or just signed your first major coaching gig. I've been using Insights for weeks now, both for my private sessions and for my professional career. Being able to easily review gameplay with my clients is crucial, and no other platform has been able to meet my standards when it comes to security and stability until I first used Insights. Hey, Iostex here, and welcome to another episode of my complete Bronze to All guide. If you want to learn more about who I am and what this show is about, make sure to check out the first episode. For more details, I'd also recommend reading through the video description. Improving at anything takes time, including video games, but a surprising amount of players don't actually know how much time invested is optimal, or how to get the most out of the little time they have. In today's episode, I'd like to answer the most common questions and help you get the most out of every single hour you put into the game, while also clearing up some confusion around what it takes to get really good. Today we'll talk about how much you should play, about the consequences of burnout, and whether it is possible to catch up with professional players this late after the game's launch. I'll cover the best ways to use your time, including reviews, warm-up, playing competitive and scrims, taking regular breaks, and your health into account. I will also explain how quick play fits into all of this, and how important consistency is when it comes to improving. I'll talk about the negative impact of off days and how discipline is crucial to learn the game. I'll address alt accounts, smurfs, and playing with lower ranked friends, how to adjust your schedule if you are playing multiple games, talk about the place drills have in competitive gaming, and whether you should keep playing when you start getting tilted. And to finish the episode off, I'll talk about how school, work, and parents can affect, or not affect, your rate of improvement. Once we're through all that, I will use the concepts we talked about to create three example schedules. One for the average high school student, for someone with a 9-to-5 job, and a teenager during summer break. Let's begin by setting some expectations. How much do you need to play to achieve your goals? That is a question that has no fixed answer. I can't just tell you to play X amount of hours a week and you'll climb two tiers in one month. What I can tell you is how much time players of certain ranks put into the game on average. Some can make it with less time, some need more time, but this should give you a fairly realistic expectation of what others have achieved with their available playtime. Quick disclaimer though, there's a very big difference between improving and maintaining a rating. Someone can play 5 hours a week and maintain their GM rating for quite a while, but that doesn't mean that 5 hours is even remotely enough for a gold player to reach GM. I'll be referring to the time they needed to improve towards a rating, not the time they needed to maintain it. Let's start with what I have seen as the absolute minimum of improvement. 10 hours a week. This is the lowest amount of time invested I have seen that yielded results in lower ratings. Out of all the people I've worked with, only those who played 10 or less hours a week weren't moving forward whatsoever despite having the right mindset and even doing regular reviews. They simply weren't playing enough to be competitive with other players. Someone who plays twice as much doesn't need to work nearly as hard to achieve results. Let's go up a notch. The average diamond player invests at least 15 hours a week. There are some who play more, however they tend to be held back by other issues, like tilt or toxicity, not their playtime. At 15 hours a week, there really is no excuse for you not to reach diamond within a reasonable amount of time. Next, looking at master to GM players, 20 hours a week is where most of them start in terms of playtime. Master and GM is a bit more mechanically demanding, and at 20 hours a week, mechanics start to become drastically more consistent. It also allows players to properly warm up, and even squeeze in some bot reviews to make their practice more effective. Once we start looking at uh, top 500 clients, 25 hours a week is a fairly solid average minimum. Some have made it to top 500 with less playtime, but in those cases, previous experience is essentially guaranteed. Picking up FPS games for the first time and reaching top 500 with less than 25 hours a week is not impossible, uh, impossible but it's quite unlikely. Once players are looking to take the next step and start their path to pro, getting into the tier 3 scene, we see a very dramatic jump in playtime as scrims start to enter the schedule. 
Most top open division teams are aiming for four hours of scrims a day, usually giving players an off day or two a week. Adding regular competitive gameplay on top of that can lead to playtime figures around the 35 hours a week mark on the lower end and the 50 hours a week mark on the very high end. Less than that is generally uh, only happening during off seasons or breaks where not much is happening. Higher values show up during seasons that demand the player's full attention. Now it is very important to understand that these values are not set in stone. Some players will reach masters at only 15 hours a week, others can play 20 hours a week and won't make it past platinum. Playtime is only one of many factors that affects how much you climb, but if you can only play 12 hours a week and are thinking about why you haven't been able to make that jump into master, or if you play 7 hours a week and haven't been able to climb out of silver, this is usually the main suspect. Players with me uh, weak mechanics in particular can see dramatic changes in their play once they start upping their playtime. Going from 7 hours a week to 14 can completely transform a player. You need to keep your expectations realistic, however. Some players will think that unless they put in 8 hours a day, they'll have no chance of hitting top 500. On the other end of the spectrum, some players may be insistent that 1 hour a day should be enough to climb out of whatever rating they are stuck in. While your playtime might not be the definitive answer to your issues, putting in the hours can really make a difference in helping you achieve your goals. Burnout won't affect everyone, but it's important to understand the diminishing returns you'll face when you increase your playtime to unhealthy levels. Some players think that they should just throw as many hours at the problem as possible. But that isn't true. It's important to understand what your goals are and to be realistic about your own limits. Both professional players and high-ranked players struggle with burnout, and it's something that you have to take serious. If you are in gold and all you want out of Overwatch is to reach diamond so you can finally play with your higher-ranked friends, throwing all your free time at the game might do more harm than good. Look at your goals and come up with a reasonable schedule for it. If you notice that the game has been less enjoyable or is turning into too much of a grind and you're starting to lose that drive to play, try decreasing your playtime. Once you hit a certain playtime ceiling, it's really more about how you use that time rather than how much playtime you have in total. Playing two hours a day, but actually enjoying those hours, can yield much better results than playing six hours a day and losing focus constantly. As you climb to higher and higher ratings, you should increase your playtime to stay competitive. But it's important not to go overboard. Assuming you are putting in an acceptable amount of time, how you use that time is the first thing you should look to change. Don't throw more hours at a problem unless you really have to. Adding 5 hours a week when you're already playing 30 won't do much. Adding 5 hours when you play 10 a week can help you climb a tier or two. As a general rule of thumb, if you are going past 4 hours a day of playtime as a regular average player trying to get to top 500, you might start to feel the effects of burnout. And if you are an aspiring professional player, you need to be careful once you get past the 6 to 7 hour mark. These are just general guidelines. Spending some extra time over a holiday won't be the end of the world, but if you are consistently putting in too much time, it might do more harm than good. One frequently asked question is whether you should even bother getting better at the game. Plenty of players have dreams of playing with the pros one day, but how are you supposed to catch up if they have years more experience under their belt? It's a misconception, and I'll explain why. Thinking it's impossible to catch up to pros requires you to make two incorrect assumptions. That all their experience is actually relevant, and that you'll improve at the same rate they did. The higher you go in terms of skill, the more minor the improvements become. It can take you a couple months to reach a level of skill that allows you to be competitive, not years. Professional players get outplayed constantly by players in competitive who put in half the time they put in, if not less. The people they face in ranked, they don't have a team house, they don't practice for hours a day, and they don't do multiple VOD reviews. They don't scrim Overwatch League teams daily, and yet they remain competitive. They won't replace them on their teams anytime soon, but they would have to go through the path to pro themselves to gain the necessary experience and then need proper coaching and scrims to actually surpass the professional players alone, but that's a topic for another video. Along with this, it's important to note that a lot of the past experience professional players have gained doesn't remain relevant forever. 
A player like Sinatra had spent a lot of time becoming one of the best Zarias in the entire Overwatch League during the second season and its infamous GOATS meta. But once the meta changes, all that experience gained doesn't fully transition into what's next. When the meta changes, professional players need to adapt, and that's when you can catch up or even surpass them. Not only that, but high-level teams do a lot of the work for you. They define the meta by adopting the most successful strategies in lower levels of play. Golds, for example, was first seen in Tier 2 competition. Top-tier teams determined the strats to be meta, and then perfected it. They spend countless hours theory crafting and studying the game, but all it takes is a single hour-long review for you to pick up on most of the things they ended up figuring out in the end. Figuring something out for yourself takes much longer than simply adopting it. Einstein spent a lifetime figuring out relativity. Physics majors can learn all about it in a semester or two. So should you give up because you'll never be able to catch up to professional players? Not at all. Quite the contrary. Professional players burn out. They become complacent, demotivated, lazy. And not to mention, managers and coaches are always looking for potential fresh replacements. If you put in the time and work, uh, and you make your way to top 500, you have a shot at getting into the competitive scene and gaining the experience needed to surpass them. This doesn't just apply to Overwatch, but any competitive sport. If you need any motivation, simply head over to Liquipedia and scroll through the list of retired professional players. That list won't get any shorter, and with each new entry, a slot for a paid position as a professional player opens up. Think of it this way. If everyone else quits, you're the best player in the world. Reviews. I will cover how to actually do a review properly in a later episode that's fully dedicated to the topic. But I want to talk about how reviews fit into your schedule. The main reason why players should review their gameplay is to find specific things to focus on. Having some specific thing to focus on during the game makes your practice that much more effective. Simply playing on autopilot, on the other hand, is not a very efficient use of your time. So how do we fit reviews into our schedule? One of the most common mistakes for individual players and teams alike is that they prioritize reviewing their games after they play them instead of before the next play session. There are multiple reasons why reviewing your matches before you start playing is significantly superior to reviewing them right after they are finished. First. Reviewing a match right after you played is not putting you into a neutral emotional state. You won't be able to be fully objective during the game, because no matter how good your mindset is, you'll always be slightly biased after suffering the outcome of a game. The best games to review are losses, and it's very difficult to review a loss objectively moments after you played it. Second, you won't be able to actually implement any of your findings straight away. The main purpose of a VOD review is to find things you want to focus on in the next game. If you review right before you play, all your findings are fresh in your mind and they give you some very concrete things to work on. If you are reviewing a VOD but won't actually play again until the next day, you will have a much more difficult time implementing what you've learned. And lastly, playing the game can be exhausting. If you just finished a long 4 hour session, it's likely that you are getting a bit tired, which makes it even more difficult to find stuff to work on in your VOD. VOD reviewing at the start of the day, on the other hand, allows you to go at it with a clear head and all your energy. It can be quite motivating to do a review while fully awake and energized, and finding a bunch of small changes you could implement to dramatically improve your gameplay and the results you are getting. That level of motivation is difficult to achieve when reviewing after you're done playing for the day. Overall, reviewing before you start playing allows you to find mistakes easier, implement changes straight away, and prevents you from letting your emotions affect your self-reflection. Let's quickly address when reviewing is actually bad, when it prevents you from putting in at least two hours a day. Reviewing is a luxury. If you can barely put in two hours a day, you are better off spending all of that on competitive. You should always warm up, which we'll go into next, but do not VOD review unless you can play for at least two hours afterwards. Two hours of ranked is better than one hour of review and one hour of ranked. You might also wonder how watching professional matches or pro streamers fits into all this. Watching professional matches or pro streamers does very little to help the average player improve, 
either because the average player simply can't draw any meaningful conclusions when trying to analyze a level of play that is so far above their own, or they might draw incorrect conclusions when analyzing a streamer who might prioritize flashiness over optimal play. Watching streamers uh, or professional matches should be done for entertainment mainly. It doesn't really become something you can actively learn from until you already belong to the top 1% of the player base. As such, I won't use it for the examples at the end of the episode. You can watch streams whenever you'd like, but it's not something you should add to your schedule in hopes of learning from it. The best games to watch in order to improve are your own. After you are done with your review for the day, you want to warm up a little. The point behind warming up is to increase your performance during the first matches of the day, and it makes a bigger difference the less time you have to play. A professional player won't need to spend 20 minutes warming up every day if he spends hours a day playing. The benefits won't be as noticeable. But if someone can only put in two hours a day, taking the time to warm up makes a very, very big difference. Warm up is to prepare you mechanically for what's to come. It's about putting you into a high intensity environment to make sure that once you queue for a game, you'll be ready for whatever the enemy team might throw at you. The higher the intensity of the warm up, the more effective it would be than simply playing the game. Keep in mind that warm up is mostly for mechanically intensive heroes. If you are a main tank player, for example, you can simply skip the warm up and use that extra time for a more in depth VOD review before. Playing the game itself warms you up, just fairly slowly. Playing competitive for two hours might not be enough to really get you to your peak. By the time you are fully warmed up, you're already done playing. Playing a fast-paced, high-intensity round of free-for-all, however, can fully warm you up within 20 to 30 minutes. It's best to avoid low-intensity warm-ups. The practice range, for example, is the exact opposite of a warm-up. It's a great place to check if your controls are working fine, without risking going into a competitive match only for you to realize that that new mouse you brought uh, isn't working how it's supposed to. But beyond that, the intensity of the practice range is laughable compared to a competitive match. So while it might take 20 minutes of FFA to warm you up, or two hours of competitive, you might spend eight hours on the practice range and still not be fully warmed up. Simply jumping into competitive is better than spending any time warming up on the practice range. It just isn't intense enough. Some players use quick play to warm up, and while that's better than hopping into the practice range, it's not nearly as efficient as a chaotic FFA round that keeps you on your toes constantly. And even worse, quick play can teach you some really bad habits, as a lot of mistakes aren't punished properly, and team comp can be messy at times. Players playing quick play tend to not try as hard as those playing competitive, so intentionally putting yourself into a more casual environment moments before you want to hop into competitive is not a good idea. Third-party aim trainers is a topic I will address in a later episode on aim. Long story short, while they are more effective than, say, the practice range or quick play to warm up, they are either going to completely neglect movement, forcing you to shoot at targets while remaining stationary, or they do a very poor job at imitating how the movement in the game you're trying to play actually behaves. So while your aim might get warmer, you'll actually have to readjust your movement habits once you hop into the competitive match. Playing Overwatch in the end is the best warm-up you can get. Playing against real players with the actual character you plan on playing in a high-intensity, fast-paced environment is incredibly effective and allows you to warm up very quickly, which helps you get the most out of each match you play, especially if your playtime overall is very limited. I'm adding scrims and competitive rank matches to the same category. Scrims are a better use of your time if you want to climb that competitive ladder. Playing ranked is a better use of your time if you want to play this competitive ladder. I will go more into team play in a future episode, but as a general recommendation, for players who are below masters, your time is better spent just grinding out ranked, while players at masters and above can benefit from getting into scrims and coordinated team play especially if their aspirations are professional in nature. The majority of your time should be spent playing the game in a competitive environment. This is where you'll find all the players taking the game serious and who will offer you the biggest challenge. How quickly you'll improve scales with the level of challenge. You don't want to challenge yourself to a point where it becomes frustrating and you spend most of your time dead, 
putting a silver player into a GM scrim won't do much for him, especially in the short term. But you don't want to take it easy either. Playing in a more casual environment that doesn't really push you to your limits is not in your best interest. Ranked and scrims naturally pitch you against players of a similar skill level, so they are the easiest way of getting into matches with a reasonable degree of difficulty. It's really all there is to it. If you want to get better at playing ranked, play ranked. If you want to get better at scrimming past master, scrim. We've gone over reviews, warm-up and competitive play or scrims. There's only one building block remaining until we can start building a concrete schedule to work with. Breaks. Even professional teams have to take regular breaks. A 5 minutes bio break, also known as a toilet break, is the standard to give everyone a chance to grab some water, get a breath of fresh air or take care of business. I personally also recommend 30 minutes between scrim blocks when working with a team. I always try to give my players a nice break between blocks to clear their head and reset their mindset before hopping into the next game. So it is worth mentioning how warm-up actually works. A lot of players are concerned that if they stop playing to take a break, they'll have to warm up all over again. But that's not the case at all. The effects of taking a break on your overall mechanical performance are negligible until you go to bed and sleep. Sleep is what resets your warm-up, so to speak. You can take a one-hour nap and you'll have to warm up all over again. But if you take a three-hour break between play sessions on the same day, you can hop in and you should be good to go straight away. Time isn't what cools you down and makes you rusty. Sleep does. As long as it's the same day and you haven't gone to bed, you don't have to warm up all over again. For very, very long breaks, eight hours for example, it might take a few minutes to get back into the groove, but nothing that you would have to hop into a free-for-all for. Breaks are important not only for health reasons, giving your eyes a rest and getting circulation going to your legs after sitting for extended periods of time to prevent clots from forming, but also for mental reasons. Playing games will affect you emotionally, and if you play for extended periods of time without taking a break, those emotions can build up and become difficult to deal with, making it more difficult to make reasonable decisions in-game. As a general rule of thumb for the average player playing competitive, I recommend a 5-minute break every even hour and a 15-minute break uh, at the very least every odd hour, if not more. I will show you how this works in detail later on when I go over scheduling examples, but it's about having breaks frequently while not having to go overboard, especially if you have very limited playtime to begin with. During a break, you can look into some wrist exercises as well. Dr. Levi has become a bit of an icon in the competitive gaming scene. He has some excellent videos on some hand and wrist exercises that make a real difference when playing for extended periods of time. Gaming doesn't have to be unhealthy. If you get out of your chair, expose yourself to some fresh air and sunlight, and give your wrists and legs some attention to loosen up, you'll be able to enjoy playing in the game for longer. Wrist-related injuries can severely hinder you, and it has completely destroyed some competitive careers in the past. Take breaks. It's important. I already mentioned the downsides of quick play during the warm-up section, but I'd quickly like to address why quick play is, at its surface, a waste of time for any competitive player. Quick play is in direct competition with competitive and scrims. We have already ruled it out as a potential warm-up, and it won't replace VOD review. So there, is there ever a situation where you would want to hop into a game of quick play instead of competitive or a scrim? None that I can think of. Quick play is a casual matchmaking experience that does a poor job at finding opponents of an appropriate skill level. Most players tend to experiment more focus on having fun rather than making the experience more competitive. And the format itself adds a lot of uh, downtime, aka time spent doing nothing, because rounds are shorter. You spend a lot more time queuing in quick play than you would competitive, and I don't have to mention that scrims involve essentially no downtime, assuming you aren't scrimming one of those teams, if you know what I'm talking about. Due to the difference in challenge, it is easy to build bad habits during a quick play match. You won't get punished as hard as you should most of the time, and your ability to spot enemy mistakes, openings and opportunities during a game won't be punished or pushed to its limits either. Quick play has no place on the regular schedule of a competitive player and should be reserved for casual players that want to have a stress-free, 
laid-back environment to play around in. Now I know what you're thinking, but what if I want to learn a new hero? Wouldn't I be throwing if I jumped into a competitive game? Not really, assuming you know how the character works. Characters in Overwatch or other competitive games that are within the same overall class of hero, for example all of the main tanks, have a lot of transferable skills. If you know how to play McCree, you'll have a fairly easy time picking up someone like Ash. Playing Reinhardt a lot? Probably won't be too tough picking up Sigma. Zenyatta main? Positioning as Alna won't be rocket science for you. So the only thing you really have to learn is how a character's abilities work. With complex characters like Doomfist, familiarizing yourself with his kit is vital if you want to be successful. But quick play is not the place to do that. Free for all is much more effective. Less downtime, more targets for you to practice on. It's a great way to improve your mechanics and learn a new character's kit. Playing a new character you are trying to learn in quick play will only end up teaching you bad habits that will take a while to unlearn. You're better off heading into competitive or scrims as soon as you've familiarized yourself with the basics of how their kit works and start learning how to play the character in a more appropriate environment from the get-go. Consistency is key when it comes to success. Studies have shown that routine helps our brains prepare themselves for upcoming circumstances. It's easier to fall asleep if you go to bed at the same time each day and it's easier to memorize new concepts when you study at the same time each day. It becomes routine. Coming up with a consistent schedule to follow can help with motivation and retention of newly learned skills. It helps you focus. For example, what's better? Playing three hours a day for seven days a week or one hour a day for five days and eight hours a day on the weekend? From my experience, the former. Going from a fairly casual schedule during weekdays and then crashing into a much more demanding schedule during weekends can have very negative effects. Exhaustion, mental irritability, burnout. Try to keep your playtime each day consistent and evenly spread and don't compensate for days where you can't play. If you normally play four hours a day but skip a few days because you had to go to a work conference or a school trip, don't burn yourself out trying to catch up playing 10 hours a day. If you mess up following your schedule, don't beat yourself up. Simply keep playing normally. All in all, try to come up with a consistent schedule you can follow each day. Don't worry too much about making small adjustments. Life can be surprising sometimes, so being flexible is important. Just avoid going from barely playing at all to having hour-long gaming sessions the next day playing at a consistent time and spread out your playtime throughout the week for best results. Next, let's talk about off days. An off day essentially means sleeping twice without playing the game in between. I mentioned earlier how you don't have to warm up again until you sleep. Sleeping is essentially what uh, resets you. But if you go to sleep again without warming up again, that's when rust forms. Being rusty is different from being cold in that it's not something that you can get rid of in a quick 20-minute warm-up. Building up rust can cost you a lot of time. For example, not playing the game for three days can build up rust in quantities that take a week or two to fully recover from. If you haven't played the game in two weeks, it can take a month until you are at the same level you used to be beforehand, at least mechanically speaking. That's why it's so important that players play consistently. Professional players sitting on the bench, for example, will have a very difficult time getting back from that, unless you get scrim time to practice them, because they accumulate rust. Preventing rust is very easy. A single round of free-for-all deathmatch a day takes 20 minutes tops and is enough to warm you up and prevent rust from building. So if your time is limited, try to squeeze in at least one small deathmatch each day. It will save you weeks of recovering from all the rust you would build up otherwise. If you are sick or don't have access to a PC, of course, then missing out on a day or two won't be the end of the world. You shouldn't force yourself to play, especially if it's unhealthy. But if you simply need to prioritize something else for a little while, think about the potential impact that accumulated rust might have and the benefits of how spending a little bit of time can save you hours days, if not weeks, later down the line. Some players like having multiple accounts for different roles, have secondary accounts at a lower rating, 
or spend time playing with friends at lower tiers. For a casual player, all of those things are fine, but for any player who wants to take competitive gaming serious, those are all unacceptable. I'll cover this more in a future episode, but it's in your best interest to specialize in a single role no matter what game you play. When put into a game, you want to be as experienced and confident on the character you are playing as possible. If you spread yourself too thin, potentially across multiple accounts, you'll put yourself at a disadvantage since you can't play all those roles at once. The only acceptable reason to have a secondary account is if you reach top 500 and want to do it all over again on a second account to have a bit of fun. For some pro players, it's a nice challenge trying to maintain as many accounts in top 500 as possible. But even then, playing one account is all that's needed to reach the top. Don't distract yourself with secondary accounts. Smurfing is the act of having secondary accounts that you use to play at a lower rating than your actual one. Smurfing doesn't just slow down improvement, it makes you worse. In professional play, teams are always looking for the most challenging opponent. As mentioned earlier, the more challenging your practice, within a reasonable limit of course, the more effective it'll be. Professional teams don't want to waste their time stomping lower level teams because it builds bad habits and prevents them from improving. Intentionally playing against players that are severely below you in skill will regress your ability to spot enemy mistakes and opportunities, causing you to form bad habits, especially when it comes to proper movement and safe and effective positioning, and will worsen your mechanics as you're practicing against opponents with significantly worse movement. Not playing the game at all is more productive than playing on a smurf account when it comes to improving. Getting rid of those bad habits can take a very long time. This also applies when you are playing with friends. If you want to get better at Overwatch, there will be a point where you simply outskill your friends and you won't be able to play with them anymore. If you graduate from high school with your group of friends and you get a scholarship for Princeton, while they don't, you need to make a choice. Stick with your friends and go to community college, or leave them behind and go to a more prestigious institution. If you are serious about your education and want to do what's in your best interest, then leaving your friends behind is better. If you are climbing into the higher ranks, say masters for example, while your teammates are still playing in plat, you need to be able to say, hey, I really want to take this game serious, I don't really enjoy playing in lower ranks, but we can play another game sometime. Playing with them for a few hours every few weeks is not the end of the world. But if you turn it into a regular thing, it will have negative effects on your gameplay. If you want to focus on improving, play on one account and avoid playing against opponents that you are clearly superior to. Similar to the previous point, playing multiple games is also detrimental when it comes to improving. While there is some overlap, games will have unique mechanics and dynamics that all, uh, don't always transfer. A game like Paladins won't be as different as, say, Counter-Strike, but it'll still be different enough to cause problems. Similar to smurfing or playing quick play, playing other games forces you to adapt your playstyle and develop habits that could be counterproductive in other games. Counter-Strike, for example, is much slower paced and strategic than Overwatch. Constantly switching between the two will cause issues. In the end, there is no real solution to this. If you really care about improving at a particular game, you want to focus on that game and avoid playing other games that are similar to it. Playing World of Warcraft, League of Legends or Hearthstone is completely fine, while playing those games won't really help you improve at Overwatch, they won't hinder your improvement or build bad habits. But if you play other shooters, your mechanics and overall playstyle might bleed from one game into the next and have a negative effect on your improvement. You want to get good at a particular game, avoid playing other games of the same game genre competitively. 
While excessive amounts of playtime can allow you to play multiple games of the same genre to a high level, most players can't afford to put in the time to improve at two games at the same time. When talking about drills, I am not referring to warm-up, but actual practice that yields the long-term results. So are drills something that you should look into? The answer is maybe, but most likely not. The drills that I am referring to in the context of Overwatch are custom game simulations against bots, be it a simple headshot-only lobby with Ana bots, or a complex workshop game mode that allows you to practice eating abilities as D.Va. Drilling a particular map or a control point in a scrim against another team is completely fine. I am merely talking about simulations of the game, not playing the actual game itself in competitive or scrims against real players. The problem with drills is that they are very niche and usually lack challenge, authenticity and pressure. They are niche because they only allow you to practice one specific thing at a time. That can be useful at times, but not for most players who already have the basics down. They lack challenge because they are in a very controlled environment that doesn't really push you to your limits. There is a big difference between eating a Graviton Surge in an actual competitive game and eating it in a custom game drill designed to practice that particular mechanic in isolation. It doesn't translate very well into the actual game. And it lacks authenticity because it cannot simulate human behavior. Eating ultimates as D.Va or landing shots on moving targets is a lot about reading the opponents and playing mind games on them. Drills oversimplify very complex dynamics, which, again, prevents them from translating well into actual games. And lastly, they lack pressure because they fail to put you into an environment where your decisions matter. You could be the best at a particular drill, but it doesn't mean anything if you can't actually execute it in a high-pressure situation in an important game. And that's where it ultimately counts whether you succeed or not. It's easy to start grinding a particular drill and get progressively better at it, thinking that you're using your time well and that you're seeing fast progress. But it's important to look at the bigger picture. You aren't necessarily getting better at the game, you're getting better at a drill. The skill won't translate nearly as well into an actual mess, uh, match as it did in a drill, and because the practice is so focused, it's to be expected that progress will be fairly fast. Overall, the only players I recommend drills to are very low-ranked players. If you are in bronze or silver, then drills can be a great way to familiarize yourself with the controls and build a fundamental understanding of certain mechanics. But once you reach even a basic level of mechanical comfort, you're better off just focusing on executing certain moves in the game rather than going into a custom game to run a drill over and over and over again only for you to hop into a game, not being able to put any of it into practice. Drills can be very useful in certain situations, but it's important to understand the purpose of drills, their limitations, and use that to guide your decisions on how to best spend your time. I will cover mindset-related topics more in the final episode of the season, which will most likely be one of the most comprehensive episodes of the entire show. But I do quickly want to address how a tilt affects your schedule. Tilting is natural, it's unavoidable. The main difference between high-level players and low-level players isn't whether they tilt or not. Overwatch League players tilt just as much as your average pled player, some of them even more than average. Even a very positive player like Emong or Harblue, they tilt as well. The difference is how they handle that tilt, how they process that emotion, and how it affects their play. There are two sides to the coin. On one hand, you think you want to stop playing when you get tilted. It negatively affects your performance and prevents you from thinking clearly, slowing down your progress. But it's not quite that simple. Think of it this way. The only way to get better at playing while tilted is to play while tilted. You need to face and confront your emotions in order to learn how to play with them. Professional players use their tilt to their advantage. They have learned to think rationally despite being on tilt and instead use it to fuel their determination. It's what drives them to work even harder and become better. But to reach that level of mental control, you can't run away from tilt. Try to ease your way into it. If you notice that you are tilting, take a short break, but don't stop playing entirely. Don't avoid the problem, 
Try to learn to embrace it. Don't let it control you. Take some deep, uh, deep breaths and cue for the next game. I will talk over some techniques to control tilt in a future episode, but simply quitting the game for the day when you get tilted will hinder your improvement and prevent you from ever reaching your full potential. If it becomes overwhelming, take a break and stop playing. But each day, try to fight through the tilt just a little more until it no longer controls your schedule. Someone might say, should I even bother improving when all the high-level players are just unemployed people who play the game 14 hours a day while I have to go to school or work or my parents limit my playtime? That's a question that is asked quite often, maybe not verbatim, but something along those lines. It is extremely discouraging to think about, but people tend to overestimate how big of a deal it actually is. Having curricular responsibilities, a full-time job, or playtime restrictions by your parents, it is not necessarily something that has to deter you from pursuing a higher rating in the game. It's important to keep your expectations in check, of course. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can't expect to reach a super high level with very limited playtime, but you don't have to go overboard. First of all, you should never neglect any of your responsibilities to pursue a higher rating in a video game. Going pro can wait. If you go to school, focus on finishing that first. You can play on the side, but make sure that you know what your priorities are. You don't want to neglect your education for a shiny icon in a video game. That said, you're not in an ultimatum. You can improve at the game and reach a fairly high level despite other responsibilities. There are three examples I'd like to give. James, swimmer, and a last player who is uh, too young for me to name. James has recently sold his own company and is quite busy with his current occupation. He by no means spends his entire day playing the game. His playtime is actually quite limited, all things considered. But despite all that, he managed to reach GM and Overwatch without neglecting his own career or the success of his company. Swimmer is an academy player I've worked with in the past on Uprising Academy. He was paid a salary to play it professionally and competed in league play. And he went to school while doing so. School usually ended at around 3 p.m. Uh, for him on most days. He would get home real quick and make the team review, or he'd join in from his phone during the bus ride back home. After that, he would scrim for four hours, he did his homework in the evening, and even had some spare time to stream his competitive games and interact with his fanbase. The last player is quite young, around 13, and his parents limit his playtime to two hours a day. Not a lot, 14 hours a week, but it was enough to reach master from gold by using his time effectively and going at it with the right mindset. Although I do need to mention, getting past master under these limitations is going to be fairly difficult. It's very rare that someone can devote all their time to the game. Most people have some other responsibilities that are taking up their time. But that doesn't mean that you have to settle for mediocrity in a game. The day has 24 hours. If you get a healthy 8 hours of sleep, more for the young ones out there, and spend 8 to 10 hours at work or school, plan and say 2 hours for hygiene and food, that leaves you with 4 to 6 hours each day that you can devote to a hobby. It's up to you to decide how you want to spend that time, but most players should be able to find the time to improve. Let's use all the concepts we talked about to create a schedule for common cases. Keep in mind that these examples are for players who are focusing exclusively on Overwatch and want to invest quite a bit of time into improving to maybe reach top 500. If you are busy with sports clubs or music lessons, you of course won't have as much time to put into the game. Let's start with your typical high school student. At 3 p.m., school's over and you're finally back home. You start your day with a fairly short 40-minute VOD review, going over a game from the previous day to find some stuff to focus on. Once you're done with that, you hop into a quick round of deathmatch to warm up. Keep in mind that you can skip this warm up if you are a tank player and instead use the extra 20 minutes to spend some extra time reviewing the VOD. After that, you try to fit in 2-3 to three comp games between 4pm and 5pm. Once you're done, you want to take a short 10 minute break, open the window, grab a snack, rehydrate. After that, look to fit in another 2-3 to three competitive matches. 
Around that time, most families have dinner, so you can use this as an extended break to reset yourself mentally and spend some time with people around you. Adapting your schedule to fit with your overall circumstances can be very effective. Once you're done with dinner, you can squeeze in another play session and then use the evening to do some homework. That should give you plenty of time to study and still hit the hay in time for the next day. On weekends, you can play more. Make sure to spend some time with friends outside as well and take regular breaks if you do decide to play for extended periods of time. Next, let's look at your average 9 to 5 job. It's very similar to the previous example, but we can get away with staying up late and usually don't have to worry about uh, any obligations after work is done. Instead of a 40 minute bot review, we can afford to do a full 60 minute bot review and instead of a 20 minute warm up, we can increase that by 50% just to be sure. After that, we get back into the regular rhythm. One hour of ranked, short break, one hour of ranked, long break, so on and so forth. Keep in mind that you can move this schedule around freely, of course. Maybe you want to relax a bit after work before you hop into a game, so you can move everything back by an hour or two. Maybe you have plans in the evening. Simply shorten your VOD review and warm up and cut out one of the play sessions and you'll be available at 8 p.m. without having to take an off day and worry about rust. It's important to understand the concepts and use them to be flexible. Depending on your relationship status or your work obligations outside of the office, you might have to free some time. Simply reduce the warm up and VOD review time and play a bit less while maintaining regular breaks in between play sessions to make up some free time for other responsibilities. And when you come home from work and have nothing to do, you can extend your review and warm up and chain multiple play sessions back to back, taking breaks in between. So the last two examples were fairly responsible. The next one is going to be a bit more dedicated. We'll try to maximize playtime and assume that there are no other obligations we need to worry about. Let's take a teenager during a summer break as an example. During summer break, you might want to get as much out of the sun of the, uh, as possible and spend most of your time playing during the evening. Keep in mind that for this example, I'm going to use a fairly average sunset at 9 p.m. Depending on where you live, it could be a bit later at around 10 p.m. So keep that in mind. Also, because someone real smart is going to make that joke, no, this does not apply to Christmas elves living at the North Pole. You don't get a summer break, you melt during the summer, you can't complain about the state of the meta in a fluid state of meta. <laughs> the overall structure of the schedule is the same. We are simply shifting it to the back a bit and adding an extra bit of gameplay to it. Starting with the classic one hour VOD review after sunset and a quick 30 minute warm up. After that, you go ranked, short break, ranked, Long break, ranked, short break, ranked. How long you end up playing depends of course, but this gives you four hours of playtime, which puts you at 28 hours a week, more than enough to not bottleneck you as you work your way into top 500. Keep in mind that depending on the rating, you might run into difficulties queuing late at night. It's not really noticeable at the more populated skill tiers, but once you start getting into masters and above, your games might get a little chaotic when it comes to matchmaking, as the available player pool shrinks quite significantly. That said, it's not as bad during summer break as it is during the winter or school season. Overall, how much time you invest depends on your obligations, life circumstances, and ultimate goals. The general structure is always review, warm up, ranked, break, ranked. Alternate between short and long breaks, skip the review if it would prevent you from playing at least two hours a day, and skip the warm up if you aren't playing a very mechanically demanding hero pool. Keep in mind that you won't be as flexible with your schedule if you are in a team that has a fixed scrim schedule, however. That's all there is to it. Don't overcomplicate it, and you'll be able to find success no matter how much time you can put into the game.